What's going on YouTube? As a React developer, you've probably heard of React hooks, but have you actually given them a shot? If not, in this video, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about React hooks and how they work. And we're gonna convert a couple of class components to functional components using React hooks. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun, so let's go ahead and dive on in. So before we get started, if you enjoy the video, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and then turn on the notification bell so you can get updates as new content comes out. All right, so just to get a, a feeling of, of what we're looking here, looking at here, we're gonna do two different things. One is gonna be a basic login component. There's not gonna be a whole lot to this. When you uh, type in a username and password and then log in, it's actually gonna show that. So I'm not using obviously real username and passwords here because I'm not gonna give that information to you. Um, and then we'll have the same thing in hooks. So one's gonna be a class component and I'll have problems with this, uh, trying to save my username and password. Uh, but we'll do this with both uh, class components and functional components with React hooks. And then we'll also do uh, this little Harry Potter, uh, a using the Harry Potter API to display Harry Potter characters. So what it does is when the component mounts or when it actually gets loaded, it's gonna go out and retrieve Harry Potter characters that then you can uh, go through and search so uh, the Harry Potter uh, demo comes from a code pen that you can have a link to where we did this in vanilla JavaScript, no React, just vanilla JavaScript. And in this code pen, we do the same thing where we query the Harry Potter characters and you have the ability to search and filter them here, here as well. Now, if that source code is not enough, you also uh, have a link to the video where I walk you through how to do that in vanilla JavaScript. So watch that video if you want a little bit more on how to filter and that sort of stuff. But back to what we're talking about, uh, we're gonna do the login and the Harry Potter characters components, both with class components and with hooks. So starting out here, I've got uh, the class component. You'll see the code here in a second. This one is working. The login with hooks is basically going to be empty and I've got React router set up to navigate between these pages. This uh, login with hooks is not working. In this case, you see it refresh the page there. And then same thing for Harry Potter characters with class components works, but with hooks, it does not. So that's our job is to now convert the login and the Harry Potter characters from class components to hooks. So let's talk a little bit. Um, let's actually just look at one of the login components. Let's get a little more screen size on here. And as a class component, if you're doing React development, you probably know how this works, but you extend the React component. You have a constructor where you can initialize state. So I'm initializing username and password and then feedback. This is just being able to show the username and password to the user just to show that this is works. In no way is this a good thing to do in a production application. Then we've got the handle login function. Uh, this thing will uh, create the feedback string by combining the password and the username and then setting the state to the feedback. And then inside of our JSX, probably stuff you're pretty used to. For each of the inputs, uh, we have a value. It's associated with a property of the state. So this.state.username and then when it changes, we update this.state.username with the value of that input as it changes. Same thing down here with password, this.state.password, update state with uh, e.target.value. If you're not familiar with uh, what's going on here, basically when an item changes, you get e, which is an event, and then you set the state of password based on e. So the target of e is the input element and then the value of that input element is the actual text inside. Uh, and then at the end here, we conditionally render uh, the feedback paragraph if there is feedback. So feedback starts off by default as an empty string. And so just kind of looking at this from a class perspective, a couple of things that you have to have, you have to have a constructor to initialize your state. You have to then initialize the state. You also then, every time you reference uh, a piece of your state, you have to use this.state uh, to prefix whatever the property is. So this.state.password or username, or in this case, also for a function, this.handle login, you have to reference that instead of just calling handle login. So that's a little bit of what hooks is going to help us uh, solve. It's a little bit simpler. It's a little bit um, more concise of a syntax. It's probably more intuitive for people who are new to React. And uh, those are a few of the benefits. It also has a lot of implications on reusability and some other things that we won't quite get into, but you'll see hopefully a little bit of how class components and hooks compare, or functions, functional components with hooks compare. So all of that said, let's actually go ahead and dive in and let's start with the login with hooks. So we're gonna take that login 
component class component, we're gonna convert it now to hooks. So one of the first things we wanna do is import something called use state. So one of the benefits of React hooks is that you can take advantage of things like lifecycle method, methods, we'll see that in a second, and state in a functional component. So most people, if they don't have to use a class component, they use a functional component. Now with the addition of hooks, that gets even a lot easier because you can actually have state inside of your hooks. So the way this works is you import use state, and then uh, if we want a property called username, we do something like this, and we'll talk about what this is or why it looks the way it does in a second. So what we're doing here is we're calling the use state function. We're passing it the default property or default value of the property username. So what this thing does, what use state does, is it returns an array with two items in it. So all we're doing with this syntax is instead of saying, all right, this is the equivalent of, let me duplicate this line, username state, and then saying username equals username state of zero and set username equals username state of one. So again, what use state returns is an array with two things in it. The first thing at index zero here is the actual property that you're working with. The second one is the function to update that property. So instead of doing all of this, we can destructure, basically take the first thing in there and just name it username and the second thing and name it set username. And then we can get rid of all of these lines of code. That's a little bit tricky, but it does obviously let this become a much more concise syntax, which is nice. So we'll do the same thing for password, password and set password. And this is going to use state again. And then the initial property of empty string. All right, so then we can also type in feedback and set feedback and use state again to the same thing, okay? So now we have access to both the properties for each one of the things we care about or the values of them as well as a way to update them. So we can come and update our inputs now with uh, assigning the value. So value of this is now just going to be username instead of this dot state dot username. Value of password is obviously going to be uh, password. And then we've got our feedback button down here. And this is going to be referenced by just feedback and not this.state.feedback. So you already see that's gotten a, lot, a little bit simpler. Then we can also have the on change. So let's uh, come down into the input on change. And this is going to be a function that accepts the parameter E. And then it calls set username and uses E.target. Dot value. So again, E is the event, target is the actual input element, and then value is the value of that input element. So now instead of calling this dot set state and then specifying username and then the value of the username, you just call set username directly. And then this is gonna be basically the same thing for the password, except this is going to call set password. All right, so we're able to track both of these things in our inputs. If we actually come into the login with hooks and then type in one of these, you see it's being updated. That's actually, that's good. And so now let's come into our form and let's have on submit and say handle login. And then we needed to, to define that function. So const handle login equals a function. And it's gonna take that parameter E for forms, we need to call e.prevent default. So it doesn't do the default form submission. And then I'm going to, uh, let's just grab this from the login page. Let's grab these two things. All right, so deciding on what that feedback string is and we'll update it to now get rid of, we don't need this.state for username and we don't need this.state for password. And then uh, the way we update this is instead of calling this dot set state, we call set feedback to feedback. So this dot state goes away completely. We've got our function inside our handle login function inside of our functional component, and we're able to use state uh, based on the use state hook in React. So now let's save this. Uh, let's come back over to our login with hooks page. I don't want this to save any of my username and passwords. Uh, let's say uh, this is username and this is password and then we log in and now we see that the state is being tracked 
uh, the way that we want, the way that we got with class components, but now just using functional components with hooks. So again, one of the biggest things you'll notice here is you don't have some of the boilerplate stuff of class components. So in, let's pull these side by side so we can look at them next to each other. Uh, this might be a little bit hard to see, uh, but just as we're going through this, the definition of the actual function is a little bit shorter. We don't have to extend React component. We also don't have the constructor here, uh, which is not necessarily that bad because one of the things to look out for, and actually I'm gonna pull these uh, back in the same window we'll just have between them, is inside of a functional component, if you have a ton of different or several different things that you wanna track, that actually takes up several lines of code to initialize versus in the class component, you can call this dot state and just assign it these things in line. So you can kind of take your pick on which one there makes the most sense. And then below that, after we've got our state uh, set, referencing this.state.username, this.state.password, this.state.feedback, and this.handleLogin, that gets really, really repetitive for things that you really don't need to do. So that one of the small obvious benefits is now you don't have to reference this.state for everything. Your code gets a little more concise and you're able to take advantage of using functional components, but using state inside of them. So now let's transition over to the Harry Potter characters. And this gets a little more complicated for a reason because now we wanna tie into uh, this lifecycle functions like component did mount in this case. So what we're doing, this is a class component, extends React component. We initialize the state to have uh, an array of characters and then a search string, which starts out as empty and then character starts out as an empty array. We have component did mount. This is a lifecycle function in React. And basically after the component is mounted, it's ready to go, it will call this function. And in this function, we're calling the Harry Potter, <clears throat> excuse me, the Harry Potter API to get back uh, some characters. So what this looks like, and we're using the fetch API in JavaScript. I've got a link uh, to, the, to the fetch API video that I did uh, if you want some more details on this. But we call the fetch API, passing it the API URL of the characters. Let's just paste that in here so you can see what this looks like. This returns an array of Harry Potter characters as you would probably expect. And then it uh, it gets the response. The response is not actually the data. It's actually just the raw response. You need to convert that uh, to JSON or to, uh, you need to convert that into the actual response data by calling res.json. And then we take those characters and we set it on the state. Now, if you're not familiar with async await, basically what's happening here is the fetch API returns a promise. Uh, you can await the promise, which gets the response. And then by calling res.json, that thing uses or returns a promise as well. So you can await that thing as well to get the list of actual characters, the actual data that we care about. To use async await, we have to mark the component did mount function as async. So those things go hand in hand. So that is the first thing that happens is uh, when the component is uh, mounted, then uh, it will go and load all these characters, which then allows them to be displayed by here. Uh, we'll come back to the filtered in a second, but we iterate through characters, and then for each character, we generate an LI and spit out the information about that character. Then inside of our render function, we decide what the filtered characters are by filtering based on the search string. So we uh, assign our filtered characters to the full characters list or array. And then if there is a search string and the characters.length is greater than zero, meaning the user has typed in something in the search and we've already retrieved the characters back, then we filter characters based on does the character's name include the search string. All right, again, if you want some extra background on how this is working, you can go and check out that video where we did this in vanilla JavaScript and it'll give you a better idea of what's going on. But in this case, we are filtering the characters based on the character's name and if it includes the thing that the user is searching for, this.state.searchString. And then we take those filter characters and we map through them and display them. And then just like we did in the class component for login, we track the value and the on change for the search string by using this.state and this.setState to update the search string. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. Now we'll go ahead and convert this over to Harry Potter character with hooks. So the first thing we want is to use uh, import use state again. 
and we'll say const, uh, what are we looking for? Uh, characters and set characters equals use state. And this is going to start out as an empty array. And then we'll also have a search string and then set search string. And we'll initialize this to an empty string. So again, what use state returns is an array with two things in it. And all we are doing is specifying the first thing in that array, I want to name characters, the second thing set characters, and then in this one search string and set search string. So it's destructuring stuff out of an array. All right, and then for our input, we can update the value. The value is going to be tied to search string. And then the on change, and this is similar to the functional component for the login page as well. It's going to be a function that takes E and then it calls set search string based on e.target.value. So the value of the input that you're in update this search string property by calling search string and passing it the new value. So that should take care of tracking the search string. And now we want to go ahead and load the information from the Harry Potter API. So the way this works is we use something called use effect. And use effect lets us tie into some of the lifecycle methods. So if we do use effect and then pass it a callback function, let's just uh, log out here uh, using use effect. Let's log that out. And we should see if we come over to the Harry Potter with hooks, don't want to worry about passwords anymore and just do a console, open up the console over here. It says using use effect. Cool. What happens is you can use use effect to determine when to do things based on changes in your data. And so if you only want this thing to happen one time at the start, basically the equivalent of component did mount, you can pass it a second parameter. The first one is the callback function. The second one is an array of dependencies. Those dependencies determine when you want to update or rerun this use effect function. So by passing it an empty array, this use effect callback in here will only run once. Okay. So let's grab, uh, let's grab the Harry Potter characters. I'm going to grab this code and we're going to have to adapt it a little bit and just throw it inside of use effect. So notice here that it's highlighting a wait. You can't actually just mark this callback as async. It's going to give you a warning. So the way we would do this is define a function const get data equals async. Mark that function as async and then wrap all of that stuff in it. Okay. So it looks like that. And then inside of the use effect, we call get data. So this is a common pattern inside of a use effect. If you want to use async await, if you just want to use regular JavaScript promises, you can do that. I like async await. So you define a function that is marked as async, and then you do your awaits inside of there. And then now in this case, instead of calling this dot set state, we can call set characters by passing in the characters that we've gotten back. Okay. And, uh, like I said, we call this function from within use effect. So if we console log, um, getting data in here, we should only see this be called one time. So we see this being called one time. If we gave this a dependency of characters, and if I was in person, I would like give you a second to pause and try to figure out what would happen here. Take a second, pause the video. If you want to think about what the impact of this would be, what this means is this callback function is going to get called every time that characters changes. So what this means is we call this thing initially It updates characters, which means characters has changed, which means it calls it again, which means it does it again. And what you'll see is this is actually an infinite loop where getting data is being printed infinitely. This is not what we want. And you can see that being printed out on the console here. So understand that use effect will be triggered. The callback will be triggered every time one of its dependencies defined in this array here changes. So be careful with what you say you want to update based on here. All right. So this is our getting data. Uh, if we come down and uncomment this piece of code and not worry, don't worry about filtered characters yet, but just do characters. At the very least, we should see our characters being able to be displayed here in this component. 
So with our functional component, we're able to tie into a lifecycle hook or the equivalent of the lifecycle hook for component did mount. We're able to, uh, inside of there, go and get the data, update it, and use our use state here to update those things, okay? So I wanna have one more thing, one more property here. I'm gonna actually add a property for filtered characters and then call the filtered characters and then use state. And this is gonna start out as an empty array as well. And then I'm gonna call set filtered characters and uh, instead of just doing uh, assign or setting it directly to characters, I'm going to do a spread of the characters array. Now the reason is in JavaScript, when I call set characters here, since characters is an array, characters is actually gonna point to this object here. I don't wanna do that a second time and have both filtered characters and characters pointed to the same object or array. So what this does is it gives me the ability to spread out the characters array, which creates a whole different one and then I can reference it uh, based on filtered characters to this different one. If that's, uh, if that's a little tricky, look up uh, pass by reference versus value in JavaScript. So we've, uh, we've set our filtered characters. Now, what I want to do is I wanna update the filtered characters array anytime the search string parameter changes. So we can actually use another use effect in here. And this time, tell it, in our parameter or in our dependencies, tell it I want this to update anytime the search string property updates. So anytime the user changes the search string, I can actually come right here and do something about it, which in this case is update the filtered character. So I'm gonna actually grab the similar component in here or similar piece of code in here. And uh, let's get the filtered characters from, let's copy over the characters. And this should actually probably spread those out as well. I think we're okay. But um, if not this dot state dot search string, but if search string and the characters length is greater than zero, go ahead and update the filtered characters by filtering the characters array using that search string. So same thing, we take our filtered characters and we filter the characters by the search string by if the character's name includes the search string and at the end, we will set the uh, filtered characters to filtered characters. And just to show you, let's, uh, let's just say search string has changed. Okay. So now let's go in and cannot read property state, uh, not state there, but just regular characters. You'll probably see that a lot. As I type in here, you should see search string has changed, which means it's using the use effect and based on uh, the search string, and it also added characters in here as well. It did that automatically, uh, just because since characters is referenced, then it probably needs to run again. If characters changes, it only changes once, but um, anyway. So uh, you can see that that function is being triggered every time that the search string changes, which is good. Now we can use our filtered characters and hopefully if we search now we see we get a good search all right so there's Hermione Harry and so on and so on one of the things you might realize is if I type in lowercase h-a-r Harry Potter doesn't show up that's because it's not a case insensitive search and also uh, I don't have the ability to search by house for example uh, which might be useful in this kind of application if you're interested in those two things uh, that is uh, something I cover in the uh, JavaScript search bar video that you can go and reference as well for more detail. But in this case, for what we're working on, we successfully converted two different class components to React hooks. Let's go back to the login.js. In login.js, you have to have a constructor, initialize the state. You always reference this.state. You have a function, uh, which is a little bit different. So inside of a class, you don't uh, give this a const or anything like that. You just say it's a function and it's part of that class. And then you reference it by calling this dot handle login. Okay, so you've got this dot, however many times in here, this dot state dot. This is in this file eight different times, which is a lot. And then there's this dot set state three different times. 
And so that's 11 different times where you have either this dot state or this dot set state, which takes up a decent amount of code and time to write, and it gets a little tedious and so on. But at the end of the day, class components still work great. I don't mind class components at all. In some ways, I think they make a little bit more sense for me, depending on the scenario, but React hooks is actually really nice. And just so you know, React class components are not going away. React hooks just adds the ability to write uh, components that have state and lifecycle methods in them in different ways. So don't think that class components are going away. But inside of our login with hooks, now we have, this is pretty concise, and you can see the three different properties and the, the setters that we have. We don't have to reference this dot state anywhere. We just call the set feedback or reference the feedback variable and so on and so on. So all in all, React Hooks gives you a little bit more concise of a way to uh, write your React components. Class components are still there, they're still good. Functional components, probably trying them out with React Hooks is a good way to go. It seems like the future of React, it seems like what a lot of people are looking to use and they're writing libraries that use hooks and they make reusability really, really nice and uh, easy in the future as you get deeper into React hooks. So as we wrap up, I'm curious, are you using React hooks? Are you just using class components and regular functional components without hooks? Have you tried to convert them? What thoughts did you have? What progress did you make? How did you like it? Which one do you prefer at the end of the day, class components or React hooks? Try them out if you haven't already. Comment in the video. And uh, I just want to thank you for checking out the video. In the meantime, I will see you in the next one.